April 10th, 1997. Fifty-year-old Judy Smith has joined her husband on a business trip to Philadelphia and plans to spend the day sightseeing while he attends a convention. When Judy's husband returns to their hotel that night, he discovers that she has vanished without explanation and cannot be found anywhere in the city. Five months later, Judy's skeletal remains are found in an isolated mountain area, over 600 miles away in North Carolina. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 7 of The Trail Went Cold. I am your host Robin Warder and I've got a pretty baffling case to cover today. A case which was once featured on this podcast all-time favorite TV show, Unsolved Mysteries. As I mentioned here before, I'm a frequent poster in the Unsolved Mysteries forum at the sitcom's online message board. And ever since I've started plugging this podcast over there, I've had quite a few posters make requests about which cases they'd like me to cover. In fact, I've received more than one request to cover today's case, the very strange death of a woman named Judy Smith. But thankfully, this one was already near the top of my list of cases that I really wanted to cover, so here we are. I have previously featured this case in an article I wrote for listfirst.com, uh, 10 People Who Mysteriously Vanished While Traveling, which was originally published on August 2014. I am particularly fascinated by mysteries in which it appears that the victim has inexplicably traveled to a strange location before they met their untimely end. So not only is there a mystery about how the victim died, but there's a mystery about what they were doing at that location in the first place. Uh, this was the subject of the debut episode of The Trail Went Cold, in which I covered the death of Aileen Conway, a 50-year-old wife and mother who was killed in a mysterious car wreck. Uh, she was found 15 miles from her home on an isolated country road, which she had apparently never traveled on before. Well, appropriately enough, today's episode is going to cover the mysterious death of another 50-year-old wife and mother. Only this time, she was found over 600 miles from where she was last seen, and no one has any idea how she got there. But before we get started, I want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there. I especially want to thank everyone from the aforementioned Unsolved Mysteries message board and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit for your supportive feedback and comments, and thank you for all the suggestions you've provided for cases to feature on future episodes, and I hope to cover as much of your suggestions as possible as I go along. In case you didn't know, The Trail Went Cold runs on a bi-weekly schedule, and a new episode is posted every other Wednesday. Uh, we've got our own Facebook and Twitter pages, and another big thank you for all my followers there. If you like it, be sure to like the Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're also available for download on iTunes, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. Uh, I also need to provide the obligatory shout-out to uh, McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and is my fellow co-owner of The Back Row, the pop culture website which hosts this podcast. And, of course, another big shout-out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. So I guess on that note, let's begin the creepy music. Our story begins in 1997, and our central figure is Judy Bradford Smith, who hails from Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Uh, Judy is currently living with her husband, Jeffrey Smith. The couple has been together 10 years, but their marriage is only 5 months old at this point. Uh, Judy has been divorced twice, and has a son and daughter from her second marriage, and they are both now in their mid-20s. Uh, anyway, Jeff works as an attorney, and he's planning to travel to Philadelphia to attend a pharmaceutical convention, so Judy decides to accompany him on his trip. On the afternoon of April 9th, they both travel to Boston's Logan International Airport for their flight, but shortly after they arrive, Judy discovers that she has forgotten to bring her driver's license with her. And this presents a major problem since photo ID is required in order to board the flight. Uh, since Jeff has to be in Philadelphia for a meeting later that day, uh, he cannot miss this flight, so Judy says she'll go back home to get her license and take another flight to join him later on. So the couple go their separate ways, and Jeff boards the flight to Philly without his wife. After arriving in the city and attending his meeting, uh, Jeff returns to his hotel that night, and he finds Judy waiting for him in the lobby. It turns out she took a 7.30 p.m. flight to get there, and she even presents her husband with some flowers as an apology for screwing things up. Anyway, they uh, both spend an uneventful night together at the hotel and before they wake up the next morning. Uh, Jeff has to be at his convention at 9 a.m., and while he's away, Judy is planning to spend the day doing sightseeing throughout Philadelphia. Her tentative plan is to take a tour bus and go see the usual tourist attractions, such as the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. Uh, she plans to meet Jeff back at their hotel room at around 5 o'clock that night, and they're intending to spend the evening at a cocktail party with friends. And this is a key point which we'll come back to later. Uh, when Judy leaves, she is carrying all of her stuff inside a red backpack, which she apparently has owned for a very long time. So Jeff says goodbye to his wife, leaves the hotel to attend his convention, and that's the last time he ever sees her alive. So Jeff returns to the hotel at their scheduled time, but Judy is not there. 
After waiting for a while, Judy still doesn't show up, so Jeff becomes extremely concerned and starts searching the city. Uh, he even takes a taxi cab to travel the route of the tour bus Judy was planning to take, but uh, he can't find any trace of her anywhere. So Jeff finally decides to go to the police and report his wife missing. He gets in touch with Judy's son and daughter, but they don't have any idea where she is either. After the investigation finally gets started, the police receive a couple of eyewitness sightings from people who believe they saw Judy at various locations in the city throughout the day, and one of them even claims that Judy looked a bit disoriented. Uh, but when the Philadelphia police fail to turn up anything, Jeff undertakes a major effort to find his wife. Uh, he prints up around 9,000 missing persons flyers with Judy's photo on them, and he has the flyers distributed all over the East Coast. Uh, he even hires a couple of private investigators to search for her, and eventually one of these investigators turns up a very interesting lead. Uh, apparently, the day after Judy disappeared, a woman resembling her was seen shopping for dresses at a mall in Deptford, New Jersey. This woman claimed she was buying the clothes for her daughter, but according to the salesperson, she seemed a bit disoriented and mentally unstable. In fact, uh, she actually tried to get another young woman in the store to leave with her because she mistakenly thought this woman was her daughter. Uh, the private investigator, uh, he seemed to think this was a pretty credible sighting because apparently the witness's description of the woman seemed to match Judy very well, and they even mentioned that she was carrying a red backpack, which of course she had with her when she left the hotel in Philadelphia. But in spite of this lead, nearly five months go by without any sign of Judy, until the case takes a most unlikely turn on September the 7th. That day, a father and son were hiking in Pisgah National Forest in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. Uh, the particular location they were hiking in is situated in Buncombe County, about 18 miles outside the city of Asheville. The pair were passing by a nearby picnic area when they came across some skeletal remains wrapped in a blue blanket. It looked as if the victim was partially buried in a shallow grave, but uh, animals had gotten hold of some of the remains and spread them out over a 100-yard area. When the police were notified, they determined that the victim was female, but she carried no identification on her. Uh, they also determined that she had likely been stabbed to death since there appeared to be puncture marks and cuts on her bra. The police didn't know who the victim was at first, but they soon received a tip from someone who had seen one of Judy Smith's missing persons flyers and wondered if the unidentified remains might be her. Uh, the local police then got a hold of Jeff and asked him to send Judy's dental records, and sure enough, once they made a comparison, they conclusively determined that the victim was in fact Judy Smith. Now, like I established earlier, Asheville, North Carolina is over 600 miles away from Philadelphia. To travel that distance by car would take approximately nine and a half hours. So, as you can imagine, everyone was completely baffled. How in the world did Judy end up there? And that wasn't the only aspect of her death that didn't make any sense. Remember, when Judy went sightseeing in Philadelphia, she was carrying that red backpack, which she apparently took with her everywhere. Well, when Judy was found, there was a blue and black backpack nearby, but no sign of a red backpack anywhere. And also found at the scene were a pair of Bowley sunglasses, which apparently did not belong to Judy. Now, this was a particularly expensive brand of sunglasses, which cost around $110. And according to everyone who knew her, Judy was not the type of person to spend $110 on a pair of sunglasses. It's also worth mentioning that even though Judy's wallet and identification were missing, she still had some valuables on her, including her diamond wedding ring. Uh, she also had $160 in cash, and roughly half of that money was tucked inside the mysterious blue and black backpack. So it would seem like robbery was not the motive for murdering her. Uh, there was also a mystery novel, a paperback novel, and a flashlight found nearby, and Judy was dressed in clothing which seemed to suggest that she was out hiking in the area. Now, this would make sense since Judy was known for being an avid hiker who loved the outdoors. Now, this particular area was a 20-minute walk from the nearest road, and it required walking up a steep incline to get there. The evidence seemed to suggest that Judy was out hiking when she was killed at the same location where she was found. But the obvious question was, why would Judy be out hiking at this particular location in North Carolina? Well, here's another part of the story which is really strange. You could easily assume that Judy could have crossed paths with some predator in Philadelphia who abducted her and forced her to come down to North Carolina against her will before he killed her. But the investigation turned up quite a few eyewitnesses who claimed to have seen Judy walking around Asheville of her own free will in the days following her disappearances. Now, in most missing persons cases, it's inevitable that you're going to get a lot of false sightings from witnesses who think they've seen the missing person, but have actually mistaken them for someone else. But there's one sighting in this case which sounds pretty damn convincing. A retail clerk at Asheville claimed that a woman resembling Judy entered her store and that they had a conversation together. And this woman apparently shared some pretty specific details about herself with the clerk, claiming that she was from Boston, that her husband was an attorney, and that they had recently been in Pennsylvania for a convention. And what's even stranger is that this clerk also claimed that the woman was in a very friendly, upbeat mood and gave no indication at all that she was disoriented or under duress or that anything was wrong at all. Which means that if this woman really was Judy Smith, 
Then she flat out ditched her husband in Philadelphia and traveled down to North Carolina on her own volition without telling anyone in her family. So if Judy really decided to do that, then the obvious question is, why? During the Unsolved Mystery segment, one of Judy's friends is interviewed, and she uses the word tenuous to describe Jeff and Judy's marriage at that time. So maybe Judy just had to get away from her husband for a while. But of course, both Jeff and Judy's kids deny that there were any serious problems with the marriage, or at least nothing bad enough to make her want to run away to another state. But even if Judy did travel down to North Carolina voluntarily, how did she wind up dead in that remote mountain area? Well, I'm sorry I have to say this, but the trail went cold. Uh, Judy's case did get a lot of play in the Philadelphia media during the late 1990s, and of course it was featured on Unsolved Mysteries in 2001. Uh, the case also got featured on a television program called Haunting Evidence in 2007. Uh, that's kind of a paranormal theme show in which psychics are brought in to examine unsolved cold cases, but I have not actually seen that episode, so I can't really comment on it. But unfortunately, as far as I can tell, there haven't been any significant developments in this case during the past 15 years or so. The whole thing is about as baffling as an unsolved murder can get, because in order to figure out who the perpetrator might be, you first have to determine how the victim wound up over 600 miles from their last known location. But as difficult as it might be, I'm going to formulate some theories about what might have happened. Of course, in cases like this, you always have to start with the spouse. Uh, Judy's friend did give vague hints that there were problems with the marriage, so could Jeff have murdered his wife? Well, after hearing the summary, you'd probably think that there's no way that's possible, especially since Jeff was attending a convention the day Judy went missing, and he seemed to have an airtight alibi. But, believe it or not, the Philadelphia police actually did consider Jeff to be a possible suspect, at least initially. Uh, they were actually skeptical that Judy even made it to Philadelphia in the first place, as they did not find the story about her forgetting her driver's license at the airport to be believable. Uh, they started thinking that maybe Jeff killed his wife back home in Newton, and then flew to Philadelphia, and fabricated this elaborate cover story about his wife getting lost in the city. And then he traveled to North Carolina to dispose of her remains in the Appalachian Mountains? I guess? <laughs> uh, yeah, I really don't know what the hell they were thinking here. It uh, sounds like the Philadelphia police did a pretty piss-poor job on this case. When uh, Judy first disappeared, Jeff had a hard time even getting the police to file a missing persons report for her, so... And uh, once they did, it seemed like they got tunnel vision and decided to zero in on him as a suspect. Now, when he was questioned, Jeff did refuse to take a lie detector test, but let's not forget that the guy's an attorney, and attorneys are known for advising their clients not to take lie detector tests because they're so unreliable. So so I really don't find Jeff's decision that unusual. Uh, I think it was Jeff's frustration with the Philly PD's investigation which prompted him to work so diligently to find his wife because, like I said earlier, he hired private investigators and he distributed over 9,000 missing persons flyers. In fact, if it wasn't for all those flyers, I'm not sure anyone would have even made the connection between Judy Smith and the unidentified remains found in North Carolina. It was just pure chance that someone saw that flyer and made the connection between the unidentified woman found in the mountains. So if Jeff was guilty, he was essentially undermining his own murder plan. Now, the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office, the people who found Judy's remains, they eliminated Jeff as a suspect immediately, and they had a pretty logical reason for that. Jeff's girth. <laughs> you see, Jeff was a pretty heavy set man, and Judy was found in a rugged mountainous area which was 20 minutes away from the nearest road and required walking up a steep incline. The sheriff's office did not think a large man like Jeff was even capable of walking that entire route, let alone dragging a dead body to that location. I guess the only other possibility is that Jeff could have hired someone to murder his wife and dispose of her body, but there's no evidence of that at all, and no real motive other than some vague implication that the marriage was tenuous, so it's very unlikely that Jeff was involved in his wife's death. But I can see why one might be tempted to suspect the husband, because it's so damn hard to figure out what really did happen to Judy. From what everyone says about her, Judy was a strong, assertive woman, so it seems pretty unlikely that anyone could have abducted her from Philadelphia and taken her all the way to North Carolina. On the other hand, Judy was also described as a free-spirited, independent woman, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that she would decide to take a random 600-mile trip out of the blue. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this was not the first time Judy ever visited North Carolina. Earlier that same year, both both Judy and Jeff had visited Durham, and Jeff apparently loved the state so much that he started applying for jobs there. So if Judy just wanted to get away for a while, you could easily see why she might choose North Carolina as her destination. Like I said earlier, it's pretty easy to be skeptical about the credibility of eyewitness sightings in missing persons cases like this, but I really cannot discount the sighting from the store clerk in Asheville. She provided so many accurate and specific details about Judy's background. Sure, I suppose it's possible that the witness could have just made the whole sighting up. She could have learned a bunch of details about Judy Smith's disappearance in the news, such as her being from Boston and having a husband who was an attorney, and then used them to fabricate a story for the police. 
but I really see no reason why she would do that. And since she described Judy being in a friendly mood, this would seem to indicate that Judy made the trip to North Carolina of her own free will. However, there are two major problems I have with this whole scenario. Number one, let's talk about the whole situation at the airport in Boston, where Judy forgot to bring her driver's license and couldn't board the flight to Philadelphia. If Judy was planning to disappear voluntarily, this does sound like a good opportunity to make an escape. She forgets her license on purpose, and this provides a convenient excuse for her not to board the same flight as her husband. And once Jeff leaves, this is the perfect opportunity for Judy to just take off to North Carolina. Yet, she still decides to take a later flight to Philadelphia, and she meets her husband at the hotel that night. So if Judy was planning to ditch her husband, why even bother making the trip to Philly? Why not just go straight from Boston to Asheville? Well, there were a few unconfirmed sightings of Judy wandering around Philadelphia the following day, so who knows? Maybe she really wanted to do some sightseeing in Philly before she went on her little adventure. Remember, no one can be sure of the exact time Judy left Philadelphia. And it's also worth noting that there didn't seem to be anything missing from her home in Newton, other than the items she took with her on her trip to Philly. In fact, Judy's passport was left behind, so if she really did go back home to pick up her driver's license, it doesn't seem like she used that opportunity to grab anything else of importance. I guess it's possible that the whole thing was an honest mistake and Judy just genuinely forgot her driver's license at the house, but it seems like quite a strange coincidence to me. Now, my second major problem with Judy just taking off on some spontaneous adventure without telling anyone? That's a pretty crappy thing to do to your kids. Let's just pretend for a second that Judy really was having serious problems with her marriage and needed to get away for a while. So she decides to ditch her husband in Philadelphia and takes off to another state without telling him where she's going. If Judy was legitimately pissed off with Jeff, then yes, I suppose I could see her doing something like that to get back at him. But why do that to your two kids? Surely, Judy should have known that if she took off for a while without contacting anyone, her son and daughter were going to be pretty damn worried. I know they were both grown up at this point, but the least Judy could do was call them up and say, I needed some alone time and just had to get away, but don't worry about me, I'm fine, and I'll be back soon. From what I've read, a selfish decision like this did not fit Judy's personality. Before she met Jeff, Judy was a devoted single mother who raised two kids alone while putting herself through nursing school. So why would she do something like this to her own family? Well, this is what makes me curious about the sighting which took place at the clothing store in Deptford, New Jersey, the day after Judy disappeared. Considering what eventually happened to Judy, I was about to discount this whole sighting, but uh, now I'm not so sure. It's pretty easy to travel from Philadelphia to New Jersey by bus, so it's not impossible she could have made it there. One of the alleged sightings in Philly claimed that Judy looked disoriented, and that's exactly what the witnesses in Deptford said about the woman they saw. So what if Judy had some sort of mental breakdown, and for whatever reason decided to travel to New Jersey before she made her trip down south to North Carolina? Now, the store clerk who saw Judy in Asheville, she said she looked fine, but appearances can be deceiving. Maybe, by this point, there was something in Judy's mind which made her think she was just on some normal trip, and she'd completely forgotten that her family had no idea where she was. In scenarios like this, I always hearken back to the disappearance of a woman named Gail Delano. I previously mentioned this case on my episode about Aileen Conway, but in case you're not familiar with it, Gail Delano was a single mother who disappeared from her hometown of Westport Island, Maine in 1986, and the story got featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. On the surface, the evidence seemed to suggest that she was abducted after going out on a blind date with an unidentified man. However, it turned out Gail had actually staged her own disappearance before boarding a plane to Mobile, Alabama, which, incidentally, is a much longer journey than traveling from Philadelphia to Asheville. Uh, after she arrived in Mobile, Gail checked into a hotel and committed suicide, and it was over two years before Gail was identified. And during that entire time, Gail's family had no idea what happened to her and worried that she had been murdered. That is a pretty awful thing to do to one's family, but Gail Delano always struggled with clinical depression, and it was clear that she was suffering from some sort of mental illness when she decided to disappear and take her own life. So, what if Judy Smith also had some sort of mental illness which prompted her to take off to another state without telling her family? Well, even if that scenario is 100% true, that doesn't change the fact that some unknown person murdered her. So, the key question is, did Judy meet harm at the hands of a stranger, or was she killed by someone she knew? The biggest obstacle in this investigation is that we still don't know how Judy made it to North Carolina in the first place. As far as I know, the investigators were unable to find any sort of paper trail for her journey. Uh, no record of any plane flight, rental car, bus trip, nothing. And it also seems pretty clear that Judy wasn't killed on the same day she disappeared, and that she was probably in Asheville for at least a few days. So where exactly did she stay during her time down there? I don't believe police ever uncovered any record of her staying in any of the hotels in the area. And here's another strange aspect of her disappearance. Even though Judy was believed to have been carrying around $200 when she left the hotel in Philadelphia, 
she actually left about $500 behind in the room. Uh, at the time, Judy was also carrying an American Express card, but it was red flagged and there's no indication it was ever used after that day. So what was Judy using to support herself during her journey down south? And let's also not forget the fact that Judy's red backpack also went missing, but a blue and black backpack, $160 in cash, and a pair of $110 sunglasses were found near her remains. Now, during the Unsolved Mysteries segment, the police expressed their belief that these items probably belonged to Judy's killer, but I think it's certainly possible that Judy could have purchased them herself during her trip. Or, since Judy was apparently not the type of person who would shell out $110 for sunglasses, what if the killer bought the new backpack and the sunglasses and gave them to her? I'd say there's a good possibility that Judy always had this secret plan to meet someone in North Carolina. In fact, since there doesn't seem to be any discernible paper trail to show how she made the 600 mile journey, I even wonder if she met up with someone in Philadelphia who drove her down there. So could Judy have been conducting a secret affair or something? Uh, this might help explain the situation with the driver's license at the airport. Uh, Judy could have conceivably concocted this route in order to have a couple of hours away from her husband, where she could use this opportunity to make arrangements with her secret lover for their rendezvous. This is 1997, when people are starting to warm up to the idea of meeting people over the internet, so maybe Judy found a secret friend online. Now here's an interesting possibility. In a couple of the articles I found, they made it a point of mentioning that Asheville had a fairly sizable gay and lesbian population at that time, and was a pretty tolerant city for accepting gay people. In fact, one of the articles claimed that the closest house to the location where Judy's remains were found was a now vacant building which was, and I'm using their exact quote here, reportedly once a haven for lesbians. <laughs> so, of course, everyone who knew Judy totally denied the possibility that she might be gay, and that's probably true. But hey, having a rendezvous with a secret lesbian lover would be a pretty compelling reason for someone to travel 600 miles without telling their family. Keep in mind, this is all just speculation here, because I don't think the investigation ever uncovered any evidence that Judy was having an affair. And remember, in all these alleged sightings of Judy after her disappearance, she was alone, and she was never seen in the company of anybody else. But given the remoteness of the area where Judy was found, it would make a lot more sense if she was murdered by someone she knew. Investigators have repeatedly said that Judy was probably killed at that exact location rather than someone dragging her body there. So which situation sounds more plausible to you? That Judy was hiking alone out in this remote area and just happened to cross paths with a random psycho who murdered her? Or she went hiking with someone she knew and trusted who then decided to kill her? I'd say the latter scenario is far more likely. But I don't know, I guess it almost sounds like I've been contradicting myself here. Some of the evidence points to Judy taking a spontaneous trip down there alone after suffering some sort of mental breakdown, but some of the evidence seems to indicate that Judy had pre-planned this trip for a secret meeting with someone else. I really hate to say this, but in the end, I'm just not entirely sure which theory to go with. Like the Aileen Conway case, it's almost impossible to dream up an airtight theory about what happened, which doesn't have a few holes. However, unlike that case, at least we know for sure that the victim was murdered and that someone else was involved. And as long as the individual who killed Judy is still out there, at least there's hope that we can actually have some answers someday. But whoever was responsible has done a pretty good job at covering the track, so I'm not sure if their identity will ever be uncovered. Until it is, we may never know what compelled Judy Smith to make her fateful 600 mile journey. But if anyone out there listening just happens to have some important information about the unsolved death of Judy Smith, please contact the appropriate authorities. And if you just have your own theory about what might have happened to her, I'd love to hear from you. Hell, if you have some interesting information which wasn't covered here on this episode, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email. Uh, in my previous episodes, I gave out my email address as robin.warder at primus.ca, but that address could very well change sometime in the future, so I'm going to give you a new one. If you'd like to get in touch, please email me at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's R-O-B-I-N dot W-A-R-D-E-R -E at I-C-L-O-U-D dot com. Robin.warder at iCloud.com. Also, be sure to check out the Trail Went Cold Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes pages. And you can also check out my true crime and mystery articles at crack.com and listverse.com. And there's also plenty of other non-true crime content you can find right here at the back row. So until next time, have yourself a good two weeks and join me for another edition of The Trail Went Cold. The Trail Went Cold is part of the Back Row Podcast Network. Visit d-back-row.com for more. The theme song was composed by Vince Nitro. Thank you.